How important are items and equipment in Super Mario RPG? And most importantly, can you beat the game without them? The rules are simple. I can't equip things on any character and items are restricted from usage both inside and outside of battle. This impacts a number of things as items are normally used to revive and heal as well as restore valuable FP. And of course, no equipment lowers their overall defensive and offensive stats. So let's answer the question, is it possible? After destroying Bowser in what is essentially a tutorial, we wake up and head out to save Peach. While there's no equipment this early in the game, the Mushroom Way section does present an issue, our HP. See, I only had 10 left when arriving at the Hammer Bros fight, and unlike a normal playthrough, I can't just heal it with a mushroom. So how do we solve it? Well, back at Mario's pad, by resting, he'll recover HP and FP, which just means that I had to go all the way back and then through Mushroom Way without fighting a single enemy. With full health, the Hammer Bros are basically a pushover since we were never intended to have equipment here, opening up the path to the Mushroom Kingdom. This is where we get our first addition to the party, Mallow, in exchange for helping him get his grandpa's coin back from Croco. Bandit's way is pretty uneventful, minus the fact that I found a special enemy, which are variants of standard enemies with a boost to their stats. This one went down easy enough, but after fighting the first, I knew these would cause issues later on in the run. After making it to Croco, I started exploiting his weakness with Fireball, but quickly ran out of FP. Without the hammer or defensive equipment we're expected to have at this point, the party had horrible damage output and took a lot of damage every time they got hit, leading to Mallow going down. However, there was an option left to me. The remake introduces triple moves, and without a third member you get a random buff or heal, leading to a lucky revive on Mallow, helping me to continue the fight. There's one last mechanic I wanted to mention here, which is the perfect blocking. If you time an A button press right when the enemy lands an attack, you can fully block the damage. One strategy would certainly be to never miss these, but considering that Croco took me almost 40 turns to take down, getting that many attacks and blocks in a row without missing an input is just not a strategy I intend to be relying on for this run. At this point, I had planned to offset the lack of equipment with level, and Croco got me to 4. This meant grinding would be an important element for the next section of the run to keep me ahead of the level curve. Also, because I didn't have any equipment, the bonus stats granted at each level became critical, and I mostly chose a single stat to focus on for each character so that they excelled in a particular thing like strength for Mario and magic for Mallow. With the coin pocketed, we can return to Mushroom Kingdom, where Claymerton has invaded. At level 4, I stormed the throne room and started the fight to retake the Mushroom Kingdom. And when I say stormed, I mean literally. Mallow has Thunderbolt, and it's this boss's weakness. As an added bonus, it also takes down the bodyguards in one hit too, and after 6 Thunderbolts, Claymerton went down. Into the next area, and the sewer enemies were a bit tougher than what I'd been dealing with, so I had to back out a few times to go and heal before continuing. I had just made it to level 6 by the time I hit Balone and managed to get all the way to him with full HP. I was a bit worried about this encounter, but due to his weakness to Thunderbolt, it turned out to be pretty easy overall. After almost dying on a waterfall, the party made it to Roseway. This was the first spot I heavily felt the result of not having equipment, as the standard enemies here could almost one-shot Mallow, and they were taking a lot of hits to take down. Even worse was that the statuses had just started showing up, and without items to cure them or accessories to prevent them, I just had to wait them out. These combined issues actually led to my first party wipe just on standard enemies. This issue was only getting worse too as I got to the forest maze and ran into the first set of wigglers. As if the missing stats from the equipment wasn't enough, they also had Sandstorm, which was a move that I couldn't block. It's not the only move like this either, as there are multiple magic moves that hit the whole team, and they're only going to get more prevalent from here. Since this knocked perfect blocking every move off the potential strategy list, I went back a bit and buffed up the team to level 9. Once again, there's no healing option before the boss in the forest, so I had to navigate it without getting hit. Starting the Valier fight put Gino on my party, but this was actually problematic. See, I hadn't checked this before the run, but I wasn't sure if he came with any equipment or not. And if he did, then I'd be breaking the rules by using him. So I decided to tackle the Bowyer fight while only having Gino defend to ensure I wasn't using a party member that had equipment on. Even after doing pretty well with my blocking, I ran out of FP and then my HP followed. After a reattempt or few, I learned that the key to this fight was controlling my FP better and avoiding using it with Mario, as his moves just aren't as efficient as Mallow's. Thunderbolt only takes 2 FP, and Mallow gets HP rain, which was critical for keeping them both alive. 
This led to me clicking defend with Mallow when the special button got locked to help prevent Mallow from ever going down. This battle was fairly lengthy, but after restricting FP usage to Mallow and getting a larger chunk of the blocks time correctly, the crew shot down Valier and unlocked the first triple move. Though, as it turned out, Gino didn't come with anything equipped, so I totally made this fight way harder than it had to be. In the search for more star pieces, the crew heads into the mines next. The first enemy encounter was going well until I got down to the Magmite. These things have really high physical defense, meaning magic was the best way to deal with them, which meant this was yet another area I was going to need to go through without fighting enemies. The first major encounter here is Croco, who is way easier than the last time, especially now that triple moves are unlocked. This is one of the few encounters that actually healed me afterwards too, even giving me all 27 FP back. Hold up, we need to talk about that FP change. Those of you that have played a lot might have already wondered how my FP max increased. You don't get any for leveling up, but normally you spend flower tabs or other items to increase it, but that's been off limits. So how is my FP above the 10 you start with? As it turns out, there are random chests in various places that contain a flower, and anytime we hit one of these chests it raises the party's max FP by 1. Since it's not an item and never hits the inventory, this is our only way to increase FP, though there are a limited number of them. Back to your regularly scheduled content. The rest of the mine was pretty uneventful until the Punchinello fight. And Punchinello is about as trivial as Claymore 10 was since Thunderbolts do particularly well here, taking off one more boss from the list. Despite the mines not being particularly challenging, the pass leading to Booster's Tower had a large difficulty spike. Mallow's Lightning wasn't doing well here either due to resistances. I knew that the tower which was up next led to me getting Bowser, and I wanted to save the grind until he could benefit from the experience too. That said, the difficulty with the pass might have only been due to how physically weak Mallow is, because with Bowser in the party we actually blew through Booster Tower without many issues and got to the Bunt fight in Merrymore. Bunt seemed really problematic at first since it had Paint Spout and Blizzard which were unblockable, but Mario, Gino, and Bowser just did a lot of physical damage so Bunt didn't survive that long. With the Booster Saga being pretty underwhelming, Peach joined the party, and was the only party member to come equipped with anything by default. When I reached the sea, the standard enemies started carrying moves like static electricity, meaning as long as I had encounters, preventing damage was pretty much impossible. Luckily with Peach on the party now, there was an option to heal up costing 4 FP, but it meant that I'd be consuming it more routinely. This was a problem once I got into the ship and started losing more HP as I really didn't want to run back through the entire sea each time I needed to heal. When I made it to King Calamari, my party had a single FP point left and Mario was at 1 HP. The first phase attacks were all blockable, but in phase 2 he started picking the party off and casting sandstorms. Despite taking a lot of damage though, I had been focused on my tried and true strategy. Take the enemy down first. Since all of my bonus stats had been focused on physical, my output was really high and King Calamari's health chopped to zero before mine did. This was an important section of the ship too as this fight heals your party and meant I could try to skip the rest of the enemies going forward. I started checking chests for mushrooms or flowers and that was a huge mistake. This chest had a wo oh which spawned many Goombas that I did a terrible job at blocking. In order to prevent needing a lot of heals, I reluctantly started spending FP to clear the fight a bit more optimally. It wound up taking over half of my FP and left multiple members really low, all for a safety badge that I couldn't even equip. Having to use more FP didn't bode well as I still had a boss left and a small section of the ship. Luckily, the developers must have expected me to try this run though, as the next segment has you find some bandana reds and there just happens to be a chest here that heals the crew to full and I picked it up. Picking it up was a huge mistake though, as the next room has you fight more bandana reds, meaning I would probably lose HP or FP right before the fight with the ship captain, so I should have waited. That little bit of loss contributed to the multitude of times I got destroyed by Johnny. This fight turns 1v1 halfway through and Mario doesn't exactly have stellar stats. His damage output during the solo duel is pretty abysmal and being limited on FP only made it worse. It is possible to perfect block his attacks, but I was horrible at most of them, especially Diamond Saw. Over time I figured out that using fire was more optimal for damage, but it still wasn't enough to cut down the captain. So I went back and did a fight or two to level Mario to 16. This time I selected magic as the bonus stat on the level up, which was a tough choice because these are permanent and I can't choose another option later. 
With that one level boost though, the fight went way smoother. And while those few points of magic didn't seem like much on paper, it promptly led to Johnny's defeat, even without running out of FP. With another star piece retrieved, the gang heads back to the seaside town, and then her newfound treasure gets nabbed. Luckily, Spirit of Ick is an absolute pushover that requires no retries or strategy whatsoever. The Land's End section is pretty uneventful, besides the part where my team was taking over 80 damage from certain attacks. My party level was between 13 and 16, so I spent a chunk of time leveling up throughout Land's End, and the Gagget Room in the Desert Sinkhole was particularly amazing, getting my team up to between 16 and 18. And those levels are fairly required in order to clear Land's End, since Balom shows up again and blocks the exit. This rematch is a lot more difficult than the original fight, and there's one more thing that's really impacted by our run restrictions that we haven't talked about much. Datus Effects. With Balom, he has a couple attacks that put the whole party to sleep, and without items or accessories to prevent them, it makes dealing with these way harder. Additionally, if he copies Mallow, the Mallow clone can use static electricity which is unblockable, so it's important to manage who's on the field and who he clones. Anytime he's got a Mallow clone up, it should be taken down immediately, but otherwise I eventually started just ignoring the clones since they're fairly easy to block. With his limited health, that made the fight fairly easy, though if I didn't level I imagine that would have been a different story. After getting help from an unlikely ally, the next area is Bean Valley, and I hit a please no, and that's exactly how I felt about this fight. It summons Jenny, and if you take it down, he'll just resummon it. Unfortunately, Jenny has unblockable attacks, so I found it better to focus on please no, but it was annoying to lose so much health and FP on this fight, especially right before the Smilax boss. Smilax set Scarecrow, Mushroom, Sleep, and had a few unblockable moves, and I wound up getting my entire team disabled. The only saving grace for this fight is that his own health is pretty low, and despite dealing these statuses, the amount of damage he deals back is quite low, and not enough to outdamage the team. The Nimbus section was very uneventful, honestly. At this point, the boost from continually choosing physical on levels was making quick work of most enemies, and keeping above the level curve kept my team winning. Everything was going smoothly until the Valentina fight. Immediately, one of our members gets pulled to fight Dodo, but as long as Bowser is center, the 1v1 is short-lived. As soon as we have to fight Valentina herself, though, she spams moves that give statuses like Mushroom, leaving us unable to do anything. The moment that Peach goes down, this fight is pretty much over, as we have no way to cure statuses. Since Peach is the only one who can remove them, this fight really is just a matter of luck. If there is some logic behind which attack she chooses and when that would let us swap Peach out, I didn't find it. Instead, I decided to keep my FP mostly reserved for Peach and just keep trying until I got an attempt where she stayed alive long enough to knock Valentina out. The Sar Dragon of the Volcano is our next boss, and after clearing the volcano easily, you'd think he'd be quick work as well. But he knows some nasty spells, and one of them is water because what? This one is quite powerful too and wiped my party, though I'm sure going into this fight without full FP contributed. Not wanting to run back out to heal, I pulled out the one tool I haven't talked about yet that helps out when you're out of FP and need healing. A triple move called Healing Rainbow using Mario, Peach, and Mallow. It actually fully cures the party and revives anybody that's down. While it doesn't give FP back, it does give us an option for fights like this where we can lead with our strongest members to build up gauge, then revive once we get into critical shape. This strat was enough to clear the Sar Dragon's HP, but he's got a second phase where he revives a Zombone. Unfortunately for him though, his second phase loses nearly half of his base physical defense, which is what our party happens to be strong against. It also doesn't have magic moves anymore, and prefers to focus on single targets with completely blockable attacks, so it was only a few punches until he met his end. But the Volcano Saga isn't done there, as the star gets stolen by the Axum Rangers, who are the true boss of the Volcano. With five separate enemies all attacking and a second phase with attacks that basically wiped the whole team, this fight was a real showstopper. Each ranger has various resistances and abilities like healing or unblockable magics, meaning that I was gonna need a strategy here. Nuking them with low FP moves didn't seem to be a good option due to various resistances. Mallow's Star Rain is something I'd strayed away from till this fight since it uses a lot of FP, but it turned out to be a good move here in order to take down more members as quickly as possible. This means entering the fight with max FP is required, but I also highly suggest going into this battle with a nearly full triple move gauge. 
This lets the fight start with Mallow getting in damage in exchange for them likely targeting him. With a full triple move gauge, the crew has time to get him back up and then star raid again to take out the black and pink rangers. Taking these two down so early by aggressively using FP sets the party up to take more time to whittle the others down, with red being the last one to focus on. Before taking him out though, it's important to get Mario, Gino, and Bowser up to full health before taking down Red. This is due to the second phase of the fight, where the main cannon hits all three of our members and hits them hard. If the party is full health at roughly level 22, they should survive a single cannon hit, which gives an extra turn or two of damage. And that extra turn or two is more than enough to take it down, as the cannon isn't particularly bulky. With the volcano down, it's finally time to take back Bowser's castle and get the last star. The standard enemies in the castle aren't really notable, and even run away if Bowser's on the field. So, besides failing the quiz door a few times, the intro to this part wasn't very notable. I thought Boomer was going to be a problem, but despite being able to KO our allies in a single hit, we can revive them with Peach quite easily, and his attacks are also not that difficult to block, so I took him down on first try. Felling him brings us up to the top where we fight Exor. This fight was a huge struggle for me, and I was thinking I'd need to go level more. That was until someone reminded me you could just use Geno Whirl. See, if you time A at a very specific point in Geno Whirl, it'll do 9999 damage. Normally, the bosses are immune to this, but Exor is the only one that isn't, so he turned into the easiest boss in the entire game. Into the weapon world next, and the standard enemies I mostly skipped over, meaning the first thing to deal with is Countdown. I actually lost this fight the first time, but learned that Mallow was valuable due to its electric weakness, and that healing rainbows should be saved for as long as possible. The rest comes down to just focusing all damage that isn't spread moves on the main body until it goes down. The faster each part goes down, the less time the enemy has left. There's also a Spirit of It clone that has to be fought before continuing, but he's kind of a pushover. Once past him, we dropped a Domino and Cloaker and oh man, I was not prepared for this fight. Taking Cloaker down was pretty easy, but once you do so, Domino drags you back into a fight with him and the Mad Adder. These two have really high magic output and can sleep the whole team. Clearing this seemed like a huge ordeal, so I just decided not to. See, when you're still 3v2ing Domino and Cloaker, if you take Domino first, there's another version of the Adder called the Bad Adder, and this variant prefers physical attack and defense, and sports weaker magical defense. So by only taking Domino down with basic attacks, the team is free to spam skills with the remaining FP to exploit the Bad Adder and Cloaker's weak stat, making this fight significantly easier and not requiring a specific strategy. The boss rush continues with a bunch of factory managers of progressing difficulty, though Mellow's Thunderbolt does particularly well against, well, pretty much all of them. At least until the factory chief. This fight is a bit different than the others and features the chief and Gunyolk. Despite Gunyolk being weak to electric, it is pretty strong, and can hit the whole party quite hard with its breaker beam being the obvious biggest threat. In order to clear it quickly, I opted for Mario, Mallow, and Peach to be on the field, and spammed Thunderbolt and Group Hug to keep the party going. As long as the party was at full health from Peach's move, they seem to stay alive, and Gunyolk doesn't have enough HP to withstand the thunderstorm that Mallow packs. Once Gunyolk is out of the picture, physical attackers deal with the chief much easier, meaning that we don't even need to preserve FP for the chief. With the factory chief down, there was only one fight left, Smithy. This fight was a huge difficulty jump, with the smelter crafting Shipers, and both the Shipers and Smithy having unblockable spread moves that dealt tons of damage. This led to a wipe before even taking down either Smithy or the Smelter, and seemed absolutely impossible at level 24 to 26. I leveled up to 27 and 28, and then tried again. That's when I realized that this fight doesn't auto heal us beforehand, so the FP and HP I lost to level was still gone, and the party failed once again. So this was yet another fight I needed to track all the way out and back through without any encounters. The next attempt, I decided to focus on the Smelter since the Shipers were being a massive problem. Mallow's Thunderbolt was strong against it, and I mostly kept him and Geno dealing damage, while Peach swapped in to support with healing. One small optimization I learned during this fight was to use Healing Rainbow with either Mario or Mallow when the triple move gauge was full, so that Peach would still have her turn and could swap out to stay safe. Since only Peach has the ability to revive, keeping her alive is critical, and risking her as a target against loss of damage is not a good strat. 
Once the smelter went down, I was finally able to focus on Smithy, and at this stage I tried to preserve any FP I had left and use physical attackers. They still could go down, but as long as Peach and Mallow were alive, options to heal weren't exhausted, and healing Rainbow would recharge eventually to make picking them back up cost nothing. After running through essentially all my FP, I finally knocked down Smithy and oh god there's a second phase. And let me just say, this phase did not go well. His head now morphs and changes his resistance and attacks, and the body functions separately. His health bar was also quite large, meaning a fight of attrition was more of a benefit to him than to me. Needless to say, I wiped. I spent some more time retrying and managed to optimize my FP usage enough to keep 25 for the second phase by using Bowser on the Smelter instead of Mallow. This time was going a lot better, and I tried to keep his body taken down to reduce how many attacks the team was taking. Despite the body being able to regenerate, keeping it knocked out was beneficial since FP and healing were limited, but it wasn't enough and I couldn't beat him with this party despite any strats I tried. So I pressed up to the maximum level the game allows, which is 30, and trudged back out the hill and back in again. Despite doing things pretty optimally, even at max level and entering phase 2 with 27 FP, I still couldn't beat Smithy. Surely I wasn't going to lose this run at literally the final boss. I started tracking his HP manually, and I hadn't even knocked half of his health out on my best attempts. But then I had a realization. There's no reason for me to take the body down. Its attacks are all blockable, and only Smithy's head needs to go down in order for me to win. So, back in, and I got a really good attempt with more perfect blocks, letting me get to phase 2 with 45 FP. While some of Smithy's heads in this phase are weak to magic and not physical, it's still generally better to only use physical attacks, as preserving FP is quite difficult throughout such a long fight. This means FP and triple attacks should all go towards healing. I'm not certain whether the key to winning was focusing on his head with damage or the fact that I got extremely lucky with him going for the mage head twice which has very low physical defense. But once I shifted strats, Smithy finally went down, and with quite a chunk of FP to spare. With the final star retrieved and the kingdom saved, this run is complete. Yes, you can in fact beat Super Mario RPG without equipment or items. Having reduced armor was a huge crux, making attacks deal significant damage, but personally I think the item restriction was a larger problem as it meant that keeping Peach alive was essential to most fights. That said, there are a chunk of post-game rematches and I have to wonder, would it be possible to beat these as well with the same restrictions? They're significantly harder and often are touted to require specific setups or strats, but it would be interesting to see if they could be done without equipment or items. So if you're interested in seeing how that endeavor goes, get subscribed as I'm working on the follow-up to this run already. Thanks for watching! This run was a lot of fun and definitely taught me how to optimize my FP usage more than I did previously. If you enjoyed, please consider dropping a like or comment as those help out the channel immensely. I'm Glitch the Box Links, and I'll see you in the next Out of the Box Challenge.